once we get the coffee today. African Assam is honestly privileged to bring a prestigious music therapist with extensive background in several facets of the music industry for the first time. It is my great pleasure uh, to share with you some of her legion achievements. When she gave me a bio to look at, I was so startled by how much she has achieved that I had to use my analytic acuity and discriminate um, among this plethora of data that she gave me uh, to highlight the following achievements. For example, uh, she has served as a past president of the World uh, Federation for Music Therapy, uh, also the National Association of uh, Music Therapists. She has been given all kinds of uh, awards and uh, fellowships to advance her interest in the natural sciences, most particularly in the medical field. Uh, for, for example, she was given a prestigious fellowship that took her to Stanford University which in turn gave her an achievement to study the architectonics of the uh, 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 health industry. That's one. But there are so many others. Um, uh, she has also served as a master lecturer at the Department of um, uh, at the at, at the Department of um, uh, Social Medicine, uh, the social medicine uh, at Harvard University. Uh, she, she has also served and continues to serve as a fellow, as a uh, research scholar at the Brandeis University. And, and she told me while we're coming here that there is one particular um, award that she's very proud of, uh, an award that uh, made it possible to be visible to her neighbors, uh, to, her, to her colleagues, and um, she wanted me to, to, to mention that to you. She was given a Lifetime uh, Achievement Award, for example. Uh, so these are just some of the um, uh, highlights of these uh, major um, uh, uh, academic uh, uh, accomplishments that uh, I associate her with. And she's uh, formally and efficiently trained by Florida State University, uh, in which she obtained her first degree. And uh, she received a PhD from uh, Columbia University. I'm sure I have not done service uh, to, to all her achievements, but the few things uh, that, uh, that, 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 that I have mentioned uh, are enough uh, to, to excite you mm -hmm. and to, to pay attention to her work and uh, uh, to grow with her. And finally, um, this um, credit goes to the Boston Globe um, that chose her uh, to be chosen among the m 11 most important Bostonians who continue to participate in changing our lives. Mm -hmm. Afghan Hassan is privileged and honored to bring Dr. Susan Hanser, a professor of music therapy at Berkeley College mm -hmm. of Music that many consider is the leading college, world leader for the study of contemporary music. Welcome to Afghan Hassan. Thank you very much. It's a great privilege to be here. So uh, let me begin uh, with something that uh, really caught my eye mm. when I uh, uh, first uh, began reading uh, Manage Your Stress and Pain Through Music, which is one of these two uh, landmark books um, that uh, she has published. This okay. particular work is published with uh, Dr. Mandel. And uh, she, on her own, uh, also has a, uh, another book that I believe is called uh, Therapy, Music th uh, Therapy. The New Music Therapist's Handbook. The New Music Therapist's Handbook. Yes. So here is uh, uh, Dr. Mandel uh, speaking about her project in the introduction to the book, which I would like to read to the audience. Music has the power to affect us deeply. It evokes our smiles and tears. It stirs memories, excites us, and soothes us. When words fail, music helps express our feelings. It guides us to relate 
and create. By focusing on the music within us, we can learn to look past our limitations, cope with stress, and relieve our pain. What great words, words that are fitting for the mood and comportment of Afghan ascent. And now, before I proceed further and begin the, the actual interview, uh, I would like to interview my guest, Dr. Susan Hansel, for the second time in a different way. And this time, I'm going to introduce her as the narrator of her own childhood, which brought her to music and wrap her life with it, a lifetime commitment and passion for music. Here is uh, Dr. Hansel describing Child Hansel. Symphony is titled the poem. Gathering rain clouds, my stricken body hears the falling notes. I was never childish, she says. I don't remember being childlike, but I was always frail. Illness was my companion during those years known as childhood. While I endured too many exploratory surgeries and diagnostic tests to count, it turned out that I had two condensial deformities. My bladder was shaped like a squished ball and it stopped functioning when I was nine. I had no middle ear at all and it stopped functioning when I was nine. I had no middle ear at all nor a canal to transmute sound from outside in. While surgery successfully reconstructed my bladder, I still have no hearing in my left ear, despite a surgically built canal. So you see that being a child was not much fun for me. When I was bedridden, and that was much of my young life, my mother would play her favorite recordings for me. They ran the gamut, from the Nutcracker suit to Ella Fitzgerald's tunes, and Frank Sinatra's croons to J.S. Bach's fugues. I could lose myself in the land of the Arabian Nights, orchestrated by Rimsky Korsakov in his, I would not dare to pronounce this, Scheherazade, or in the pastoral scenes of Beethoven's Sixth Symphony. While I listened, I was in magical places far more interesting than my bedroom. I even forgot the pain I was in and the loneliness I felt because I couldn't go to school. After my ear surgery, my parents offered to buy me a present. My choice was clear. I wanted a piano. Although it took them years to pay it off, although it took them years to pay it off, my parents invested in my future with that purchase. And here I am today, writing this book. <laughs> that piano was my best friend. And it rang out either good cheer or deep despair. Depending upon my mood, my made-up song sang out just what I needed to say. Perhaps it was inevitable that I would become a music therapist. I had certainly experienced the healing powers of music in my own recovery. Whether I listened, played, or sang, I felt nurtured and soothed while the music surrounded me. My record player could bring a whole orchestra to my bedside, and I was grateful to hear such beautiful music 
any time I wanted. When I was up to it, I could play my piano and express things I did not know I felt. Later, as an adult, I learned an even more powerful lesson about the impact of music on pain. About the impact of music on pain. After nine healthy months of pregnancy, my water broke and I arrived at the hospital. Nurse after nurse tried to hear a fetal heartbeat, but none could. Nurse after nurse tried to hear a fetal heartbeat, but none could. For the next 14 hours, I endured labor, knowing but not really believing that my baby would be stillborn. For the next 14 hours, I endured labor, knowing but not really believing that my baby would be stillborn. Fortunately, I brought my music with me. I chronicled my experience in childbirth, child death. Awesome words, awesome narrative, for which I thank you. So perhaps if you concur, it may be appropriate if you can um, begin the show uh, in your own way by introducing us to the instrument that you brought with you. Ah. that you dearly love. Um, I'm Indeed. sure you love it as much as you do your piano. <laughs> and uh, that will set the tone of the interview for my curious audience. I, I, I feel that um, uh, the, the audience just glued to their chairs in their living rooms ah. waiting for this uh, particular performance. Maybe, may we begin? Well, thank you. And I appreciate your eloquent reading of, of my words. Um, and this is my Native American flute. Um, it's the best way that I can find to introduce myself. So thank you for the invitation. Which takes me to the um, heart of the interview today. Yes. When I listened uh, to, to that organized sound, it took me to several parts of my being. Ah. It touched the nerve center of my being. How does music do that? Ah. How did this sound? manage to enter my, my soul? Oh, I wish I could answer that. We have some ideas, some theories. I think what keeps me in this business of 
using music as therapy is that we'll never know the answer. And what affects you one way may affect someone else very differently. And everyone who listens and experiences the same set of sounds will have a completely unique response to it. So I'm pleased to hear that, that it affected you in a physical way, yes. perhaps a soulful way. Many people, um, when they close their eyes and listen to this, they can picture nature. Perhaps it's the, the beautiful wood uh, of this Native American flute that uh, brings them to a woody place sometimes, a forest. And maybe you could hear some birds. Yes. I uh, was improvising on this, but thinking myself of a beautiful place in my mind's eye. And so the birds came to mind, and some fluttering, whether it was bird's wings or waterfalls or a brook. Um, and often, it's able to allow people to enter a beautiful place in their mind's eye. Hmm. Hmm. How it does this um, is not well known, and yet we do know that when we listen to music, never mind play it, sing it, respond actively to it, dance to it, we're engaging so many areas of our brains. Those images that I described, they are actually in the occipital lobe. It's in the very back of the brain. It's that area where visual stimuli are processed. So when you see something, it's that occipital lobe in the back of the brain that serves as the camera and takes that picture for you to then perceive and make meaning of. Well, what's interesting to me is that when I play that Native American flute, if someone out there had closed his or her eyes and found themselves in another place, that place is actually being activated in the occipital lobe as though they were there, as though they actually saw that. If we put that person under a brain scan, the same parts of the brain would be activated. So this imagery, as we call it, that are induced by the music are very powerful. And so you can imagine that someone who is in pain, whether it's emotional or physical, can actually go there in their mind's eye and their bodies, their brains, are processing it as though they were there. Far away from a hospital room, far away from a place where you don't want to be. So that's just a part of it. Perhaps um, you or others had a memory, an association with that sound. Maybe you've heard it in uh, some sort of ceremony or some ritual. And if it brought that back, that memory, it would again be as though you were there. Your body, your brain would be processing it in a very similar way. And so when we go back to a really fond memory, we can re-experience being there. And that's another part of how it is that music can help us to feel better about ourselves, to feel better about coping with whatever it is that we are dealing with in the moment. And uh, the memories, associations, images, the mood. Your mood can be lifted. My mood was lifted when I heard the introductory music to your show. Beautiful, primal music, starting almost like a heartbeat. Yes? And sometimes it's that music that speaks to us. And music that speaks to you may not to me, and vice versa. We each have our own music. And as a music therapist, one of my important jobs is to find that music that not only speaks to you, but engulfs you in something that is beautiful and beyond words. <laughs> well, uh, we're going to return to the um, discussion of the flute 
yes. in relationship to both the brain and, uh, and also the human heart mm. um, towards yes. the end of the interview. All right. So uh, in the meantime, uh, I, I'm fascinated by so many things that you have done in this book. Thank you. That excerpt that I read, uh, which is ah. the narrative about your own life, yes, is so moving. I would like to hear more. Well, thank you for bringing it up. The book is meant to be a practical guide for people who are coping with stress and pain. But it, as, you, as you could tell, it's a very personal book. And uh, I think that it's my own personal experience that makes me a credible helper. Correct. More than my credentials. Absolutely, and that's what I thought. Yeah, and that's why and I began so uh, yes, so I I think it's important to introduce who I am, and certainly how I gained the knowledge that I try to articulate and communicate in the book. And um, so much of my childhood, uh, as as you read. Um, was focused on my best friend, the piano. The piano. Mm -hmm. And I learned that um, I could be someone other than this sick little girl. Mm. And the identity of musician and composer and improviser was a much more positive framework than a sick little girl. I and I wasn't a victim anymore when I could take control of who I was and who I wanted to be and go to the piano and express anything I wanted. And the piano would not talk back. I could play, however, loudly. My parents were very tolerant. <laughs> and they really allowed me to experiment and see what this piano could do for me. And I, I, think, I think I could say it, it saved my life. Yeah, it, it appears I mean, to be that I, way. I don't know if I didn't have the piano. In, it was in my bedroom, by the way, <laughs> um, crowded into a small bedroom, but very important for me to have it right there with me all the time. I don't know. I don't know that I could be sitting here today. I, I, really, I really have to say that, that the music enabled me to feel strong and to feel like a different person. Hmm. Yeah. While I was um, reading that passage and also uh, thinking about your own childhood, I was invariably led to be curious about the kinds of relationships that um, Miles Davis and uh, Coltrane mm. might have had uh, with their instruments. But yeah. I was in privy to interview these giants. Yeah. Mm, uh, I wish I had, mm. uh, because I would Me have too. wanted to know yes. mm, uh, what their relationships were mm. with their instruments. I'm sure you're equally curious. Oh, uh, I don't absolutely. think I have read um, any interview that has examined this um, level of relationship between an instrument and a musician. Uh, so I was led to, to fantasize about that. Now, mm. this is another way of saying this. Um, if that piano that your parents bought for you is still the piano that you're playing? No. In fact, I'm very, very proud that um, that piano um, made its way to my grandmother's home in Florida. And when she died, um, I donated it to the hospice, the hospice mm -hmm. of Palm Beach County. And um, we now have music therapy interns who are working at that site. And they have been able to use the piano in a chapel to perform for others, uh, to have memorial services, um, and to use it for their own pleasure mm -hmm. and enjoyment. Mm -hmm. Have you lost any kind of um, uh, uh, intimacy uh, because that piano 
is not the piano that you play now? You know what? I think that um, it's, it's almost the reverse of that. I think that um, discovering instruments, this is a fairly new friend. I think I, I purchased this maybe 10 years ago. I see. Uh-huh. And I have some instruments from all around the world. I'm very fortunate to have uh, begun a collection. And I have a small harp called a lyre, mm -hmm. L-Y-R-E. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's the lyre of the Bible, correct? The lyre yes. of yes. David. Yes. He played for Saul um, and apparently healed Saul with that lyre. So I had to have I one. So it's a small harp. It's 12 strings. And um, I can get certain effects on that, that I could never do with a piano, that I could never do with a flute. And so I've come to discover the unique nature of many different instruments I see. and what therapeutic value they might have. But I've also learned how important the therapist is and the person and the relationship. And that is a key. It's not just that this is a healing instrument, although Native Americans used it in their sweat lodges, in their healing ceremonies. Uh, I don't claim to heal with the sounds, but I do claim to help with an instrument or two with a voice, my presence, and the relationship with the person. <laughs> OK. Now, the next um, territory that we're going to examine is um, exceedingly difficult to comment on, um, although reading your book helped me considerably um, and lessened my fear of um, uh, reading uh, clinical literature uh, because I'm not a medical doctor. But your summaries, uh, your, your confident summaries of um, the medical field and its relationship to music um, uh, was less distressful than journals of uh, medicine <laughs> that they have read, which, to use your language, mm, give me stress. Uh -huh. And uh, as a consequence, they kill my intellectual curiosity. This work, on the other hand, um, helped me to become attracted to medicine. Oh. And because of your book, in fact, I'm going to take a course at Harvard on, uh, oh. um, uh, particularly on on the human heart. And I've done quite a bit of work as a philosopher on what I think um, human hearts do. Yes. Uh, but I'm deficient with respect to the physical functions of the heart, mm. um, uh, which would require me uh, to study medicine. Now, yes. uh, what is the relationship between uh, music and, and the brain first? Well, I began to explore that subject a little bit when I was telling you about the response to the Native Americans. Yes, you did. Correct. So it's not only those areas that I mentioned in the brain, but almost every part of the brain mm -hmm. literally lights up in a brain scan when one is fully engaged in, let's say, singing a song that has some meaning to you. Amazing. And I like to say that the music goes right to the amygdala, which is a little almond-shaped body in the center of the brain in the limbic system. And it is an area that's extremely important in emotion and in fear. And so there might be an immediate response that you have. You don't have to think about the notes that I played or, or the words to a song or the particular memory that you have associated with it, but you will just automatically have a response. In fact, when you listen to your favorite music, I wonder, do you ever feel chills or something that is quite inexplicable? but something that's very real and visceral. You feel a change in your body. Well, there are research studies to say that not only is your brain affected in many, many ways and in many parts by the music, 
but your heart rate, your blood pressure, your vital functions hmm. are affected by music, particularly music that has great meaning to you. Amazing. And you have actually seen this scanned. Absolutely. Mm. And in fact, um, patients in the ICU, in uh, intensive care, um, when a family member comes in and sings to them or plays some music that's had an important part in their lives, you see that all of the vital signs that are being displayed on the monitor begin to change. The heart rate goes down. The blood pressure goes down. In the book, I talk about a man who had a, um, a kidney stone, and he had a lithotripsy, which is uh, a procedure to break up the kidney stone. And during the first procedure, he had quite a traumatic response to this. And he had to remain in the recovery room for some time because they couldn't get his vital signs back to normal. And this time, they had earbuds, little, um, little uh, earbuds that could provide his favorite music throughout the surgery. And when he woke up in the recovery room, I don't know if you've ever had this experience, but often after any sort of surgery, if you're under anesthetic and you wake up, you don't know where you are. You're often disoriented. And you're in a recovery room with lights and beeping instruments and faces that you don't know. And there can be a panic that sets in because you really don't know what is happening. And for this gentleman, he awakened to this familiar music. And he had a chance to orient himself before he had that rise in blood pressure and heart rate that is a natural part of waking up after uh, the anesthetic wears off and often in physical pain. And so for him, this was very dramatic. It wasn't just the effect on his brain and on his vital signs, but also on his psychological reaction to being in the recovery room in a strange place, hooked up to all sorts of IVs. And you can imagine how humanizing this experience is when one is surrounded by familiar, comforting music. Of course. And now, um, Susan, up until I read this book, uh, I will have to be very honest with you. Um, I used now to take these uh, musics that I'm treated to when I call corporations, mm -hmm. when I visit hospitals, yes. when, as you say, mm, I visit uh, with patients mm -hmm. and um, sense that they are being treated to certain kinds of musics after surgery. Mm -hmm. um, I used to think that this, these are just merely technological gimmicks. Ah. But um, after reading your book, you have opened a horizon of seriousness for me. How lovely. I'm going to begin taking these musics that I reluctantly listen to mm. seriously. Yeah. Would I be uh, correct to, to have oh. a change of heart? Well, I, I appreciate your change of heart. I think that so many of us take music for granted, as you've implied. We go to a grocery store, we go to a hospital, we go to uh, any public place, an elevator, and there's music going in the background. Yes. And we may or may not like it, but it's actually influencing our behavior. You know, in grocery stores, music is played so people will linger, and they'll buy more, and they'll be in a better mood, and so they may choose a few more items than they would otherwise. And so... Music is a very powerful influence on our behavior, but we often don't think of it that way. <laughs> we think of it, oh, it's just that music in the background. As a music therapist, I put music in the foreground. I really think that 
another part of my job as a music therapist is to tell people how to really listen to the music and how to use it in a very functional way in their lives, particularly when they're under some stressful condition or they're in pain. And that is where its power is really evident. So, uh, you'd make a distinction, correct me if I'm mistaken, between the various uses and misuses of music by certain parts of the music industry, for mm. example, yes. from the serious, scholarly, carefully researched potential use of music that is linked to ameliorating the human condition, yes. particularly for those who are victimized by certain illnesses. Cancer is one of them. Yes. Uh, your work at the Dana-Farber Institute, for example, which I deliberately did not mention in the, in the introduction, uh, is quite appropriate to bring in to, uh, to, to highlight this. It is there, I think, uh, that your work as a uh, music therapist has con concretely contributed. To, to, to the victims of uh, cancer. Well, thank Perhaps you. we could talk about that thank a little. Thank you. I, I would love to. They have taught me so much. Um, I, I had the privilege of uh, doing a research experiment there. Um, I, as a clinician, had seen how uh, people in the infusion room, when they're getting chemotherapy, yes. Um, could respond to music, could relax deeply. And I had seen as a clinician some of the ways in which they would perk up when I would bring in one of my favorite instruments. Amazing. And begin, and begin playing. But it wasn't until I engaged in a scientific research study that my colleagues were able to really believe what they were hearing <laughs> and what they were seeing. And so um, I was able to do what is called a randomized control study, which is the gold standard for any sort of scientific research or medical research. And so I had a control group. And I had uh, actually 50 women with metastatic breast cancer. That means that they were in the, um, the last stages uh, that they had advanced cancer and that it had spread, it had metastasized. So these women um, were at a most stressful point, of course, as you can imagine. And I wanted to see if music therapy and how music therapy could work for them. So I accompanied them to their first chemotherapy session. And I brought my Native American flute, I brought With you. my lyre, I brought my keyboard, I brought a guitar, I brought everything I could carry. And I said, I'm just going to play some music for you. You don't have to do anything. Amazing. And I would start and play and watch their response. And then I would say, do you like this? Is there something else you'd like me to try? Is there a song that you'd like me to play? Is there something you'd like me to sing? And so. I only asked for their choice and nothing else. And I continued to play for the duration. And um, we actually looked at their heart rate, their blood pressure, and uh, something called a visual analog scale. They would just check off on a line. How stressed are you? How much pain are you in? How comfortable are you? And then after that music therapy session, we would do the same measurements and, in fact, found that there was a significant increase uh, in the positive uh, areas. So mm -hmm. decreased heart rate, decreased blood pressure, and increase in the psychological response mm -hmm. in their perception of stress, pain, and comfort. Wonderful. And uh, in the second session, I returned for the next chemotherapy. and. This time I said, I'll be happy to play whatever it is that, that you would enjoy. But this time, let's play together. I'd like for you to, to help create the sounds that you like. 
And I brought instruments that are very easy to play and require no training. I brought an, a, a rain stick. And all you have to do with a rain stick is to balance it mm -hmm. and just move it slightly. And if you close your eyes, it can sound like rain or like a waterfall. And again, it brought them to a, a very foreign place, yeah, not so like imagine. the infusion room with its metal and its glass and its sterile environment. Amazing. And I brought hand chimes. I tuned them to the pentatonic scale. That's the five-note scale that is um, primarily used in Asian music. And so it's a whole tone scale, which means that no two notes are closer than a whole tone. So that very dissonant do 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 if you can picture those notes together, would sound quite dissonant. But the whole tone scale sounds lovely no matter what you play. I see. But no matter what notes you play together. And so we would just improvise. And these hand chimes are such that they bounce back, the sound that is, bounces back to you from these hard surfaces, these metallic surfaces. And you can feel the vibrations of these sounds in a very real way, in a very visceral way. <laughs> so we were creating music that literally engulfed them in these beautiful creations that were one of a kind. Incredible. And while we are um, uh, uh, speaking about research, yes. um, you have also been given a prestigious fellowship at uh, Stanford University, I think, by yes, the uh, World uh, Health Institute, correct? National uh, Institutes of Health. The National Institute yes. of Health. And uh, what were your um, um, uh, t t what w what was your uh, project there? Ah, well, I worked with older adults in that setting, and people who were homebound. They were um, people who, because they were caring for someone perhaps with dementia or some physical condition, could not come out of the house for treatment themselves. They were people who uh, were indigent and couldn't afford to travel to a clinic for help. Um, they were homebound beca perhaps because of their own physical or cognitive difficulties. And so I found a way to create music for them that was built on music that was important in their lives. And I would teach them some very simple techniques like how to use music to engage the brain in creating images, and how to breathe with the music and find a way to relax your nervous system. OK, all right. And now uh, I see your um, beautiful book right um, in front of you. Thank you. And uh, I also see from a distance uh, that um, uh, you have uh, or you're planning to uh, share some parts of it with us. Oh, yeah. uh, I think I'm right. I would love to. Uh, Thank you. Would you like to do so? Uh, Thank you. Take anything that you want um, uh, that your audience um, uh, should be interested in. Well, it could thank be you so much. Um, planning your own music, which is a thrilling and uh, engaging <laughs> chapter in the book. Thank it you. could also be a description of the CD. Just introduce your work uh, without big shots. Oh, thank you so much. Yes. Thank you for this opportunity. Um, this was a, a labor uh, of love. And, and in writing the book, we really gathered stories from people who have, benefit, who have benefited from using music as therapy, benefited from uh, using our suggestions. <laughs> and um, so I'd love to read to you about Andrew. Andrew realized that stress was contributing to his cardiac illness. His physicians had warned him for some time that he had to do something about the stress in his life, but he felt powerless to change. Here's a quotation from Andrew. I was a super stressful guy. Nothing could help me because it had to come from within. After listening regularly to the music, 
I learned how to relax anytime. It helped to reduce stress, and I could do it anywhere. I don't find myself that stressed anymore. Listening to the CD helped me to realize that I have control. Rather than outside influences controlling my fluctuations of stress levels, I look at those situations that I get in. I look and see what's going on, and I react a whole lot differently than I used to. So that's Andrew. That's wonderful. That's <laughs> wonderful. Well, um, we have about uh, nine minutes left, and there are two areas that I would like us to, to explore. Yes. One is um, what I promised the audience, to return to what I felt when I was uh, listening to the flute. I felt as if all my senses were engaged, ah. but the most engaged part of my body, I am being honest with you, uh, was my heart. Uh, and yet, as you know, the research that you've conducted does not even mention the heart once. Ah. <laughs> um, the research is centered on the brain. Mm -hmm. And yet, if I, my sensation means anything to the world, it doesn't follow that it should. But in the event that it does, mm -hmm. then what I am reporting uh, uh, is that I felt the power of the music right in my heart, ah. not my brain. Yes. What's wrong with me? Uh, <gasps> Nothing so. is wrong with you. Nothing at all. Mm -hmm. And I feel as though I live in two worlds, maybe three worlds. The world of the body, the mind, mm -hmm. and the soul. The work came out of, as you read earlier, my own very personal experience. And it was heart work, heart work, not hard work, heart work. Heart work. That I say your that own inspired. existential uh, experience was heart centered. Absolutely, absolutely. Mm -hmm. But to, to make it as a music therapist, I had to convince the medical community, yes. the community of insurance, health insurance providers. I have to convince the consumer that this is more than the syrupy background music that we hear wherever we go, it seems. Correct. And so I felt obliged to become a scientist and that's where this fellowship, uh, the postdoctoral work at Stanford, enabled me to learn the vocabulary that could convince those parties who are making decisions about what services should be covered under insurance, what services are truly efficacious. And it's true that just listening to a piece of music may or may not be helpful at all, but used in a very functional, specific way with a particular piece of music, with a particular technique of music therapy, that is what makes all the difference. Wonderful, wonderful. <laughs> and of course, um, we have just touched the surface. Um, when <laughs> Afghan Hassan um, invites you again, uh, provided that you'll make up the uh, time for Thank us. Thank you. Uh, I would like us to um, enter uh, deeply into the relationship between music and what you call uh, the mind, uh, spirit, and soul. As mm -hmm. you know, the, the ancient Egyptians uh, did not separate uh, right. the, the mind and the soul, right. um, as we moderns do. Mm. Nor did they think much about the brain. As you know, they used to suck it out and throw it for the brain, yes. uh, but the heart, the human heart, meant everything to them. And um, in, in that context, when he played this flute so beautifully, Thank it you. began communicating with my heart, through which I think, and not my brain, which only processes 
that which the heart has originated already. Oh, I agree. And as you know, this work has yet to be done. Maybe the next century will be a century that will commit itself to studying the human heart. Oh, I For hope so. For now, in a brain-centered uh, centered world, um, as you put it quite well, uh, to convince the medical community uh, to carry out our research programs, uh, to sell our visions and intelligences, we have to accommodate the dominant um, orientation of the market. Mm, uh, I, I do understand that. Now, uh, by way of honoring uh, this uh, tremendously important book that you and Dr. Mandel um, has published, mm -hmm. I would like to return to what I briefly mentioned in the interview, which you also talked about um, uh, quite movingly in the car, namely uh, the, 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 this um, award that the Boston Globe gave you, yeah. um, uh, which is an award you told me that made it possible for you uh, to, to, to interact with your neighbors, uh, your mm -hmm. colleagues, by bringing music to them. Why are you so proud of this um, uh, particular award that oh. the Boston Globe gave you? Well, how are you, you changing lives, in other words? Ah, well, uh, I, I don't know how I'm, how I'm changing lives, but I am deeply honored that my, my own neighbors and colleagues um, have somehow recognized. Um, I don't know that they've recognized me as much as recognizing the power of music. Something that's so natural to mm -hmm. all of us, mm -hmm. that is so obvious mm -hmm. in many ways, and yet they are acknowledging that music and music therapy changes lives. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm glad to be the messenger in mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. And now um, we have about uh, one minute left. Um, is there uh, something particular, uh, something so important and soulful to you that you would like to share with my? beloved audience. Ah. I have a very special audience. You do, So treat I know. them in a very special way. I, I will try. Well, beloved audience, I think that the most important thing for you to know is that music is there for you. And next time you hear it, next time you think of singing something or playing an instrument, go for it that music can enhance your life in so many ways. Try it. Thank you. Well, this has been your host, Theodros Kiros, for African Accent. Thank you so much, Dr. Hansel, for coming and um, enlightening us, uh, uh, expanding our visions, um, stretching our horizons, and inviting our imaginations to do this um, important existential work which is essentially this. As you put it, take music seriously. Music can heal you. Thank you. Thank you so much.